Hi everyone, welcome to the second part of the Stellar Astrophysics video. Uh, today we're going to be finishing up our presentation on stellar physics, and we're going to pick up where we left off, which is we were looking at the tracks of uh, evolutionary tracks of stars. Now remember, we're doing a black box of physics. The actual details of a lot of the stellar evolution is not something we need to worry about, but we do care about how stars appear on the outside and then how they affect the galaxy. So then we're going to talk about uh, stellar winds and supernova explosions and evolutionary tracks. And let's get started with what we mean by an evolutionary track. This is a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So we're operating now in a theorist's HR diagram. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, you see effective temperature. That's the surface temperature of the star. And then we see luminosity on the vertical axis. That's the how bright the star is, the total amount of power that's being emitted from it. And when we talk about an evolutionary track, what we're talking about is the changing surface properties of a star, the emergent properties that we can observe, but these are a function of the internal conditions. And so when we talk about stars moving in the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram on a evolutionary track, it's not moving through space, it is changing its luminosity, temperature, and therefore radius because of the Stefan-Boltzmann law as uh, the system evolves. So we're going to talk about a bit about the physics, and we're going to then talk about how that plays out in the observed space. The first step in a stellar evolution is the star formation, and this is called the pre-main sequence phase. So that happens when a gas cloud collapses down and eventually forms a star. We'll talk about this more in the context of stellar populations later, uh, but for now you should just know that we start out with a gas of hydrogen, mostly hydrogen, a little bit of helium, and then a trace amount of metals, and it collapses down to form a uh, gas cloud that eventually ignites nuclear fusion. And in doing so, it sort of follows, for a one solar mass star, it follows this track down, it does a little hook up here, and lands right here on this star, which is the zero age main sequence, which is when a star ignites hydrogen into helium fusion in its core. And so when we say a main sequence star, that's what we mean. Hydrogen, fusion into helium in the core of the star. If, if either one of those is not true, not a main sequence star. So uh, the zero age main sequence or ZANS is where the star begins its life. And then it does a fairly stable evolution, largely doing the same thing for its main sequence life until it reaches the TAMS, which is when it runs out of fuel in the center of the star. That's the terminal age main sequence. So from the ZAMs to the TAMs, there is a little evolution. The star is getting hotter and a little bit brighter. And the reason it's doing that is that the star is losing particles out of the center of the star. And that's from nuclear fusion. You take four protons and two electrons, and you turn them into one helium nucleus. And that one helium nucleus has uh, the same temperature as the six particles, uh, before uh, nuclear fusion, and, but therefore it's carrying one-sixth as much a contribution to pressure. So the star loses a little pressure support. So the number density of particles drops from nuclear fusion, the pressure support goes down, the star collapses a little bit, and that means that it, uh, you know, basically the star falls down a little bit. So it liberates a little gravitational uh, potential energy, turns it into kinetic energy. This heats up the center of the star, accelerates the rate of nuclear fusion, and that leads to an increase in the luminosity. So the increase in luminosity is just evolution on the main sequence. So the star gets hotter and brighter while hanging out on the main sequence. This is a silly little diagram of what a main sequence star looks like, uh, where we have an envelope, that's the inert outer layers of the star, unprocessed material that's the same as the gas cloud it collapsed out of, and then in the center we have core hydrogen fusion going on. And then I'll use these colors to kind of indicate different parts of the structure, and then how these things move in the HR diagram. So the next step is what happens with a evolution to a red giant 
uh, star. Uh, the star eventually runs out of mater uh, material to fuse at its center. It builds up an inert helium core. That core uh, eventually will collapse down and uh, get stopped by degeneracy pressure, which basically says that there's a pressure of support just from a high density of matter. The equation of state, as you might recall, goes uh, like uh, rho, the mass density, to the five-thirds. No dependency on temperature. Uh, but around that core, there is nuclear fusion going on. Uh, the hydrogen is very, still very merrily fusing into helium in this shell around uh, the star. So uh, in this process, uh, the principles of stellar evolution say that the core actually gets a little smaller and the envelope, the outer layers that we can observe, gets larger and then the luminosity increases. And so if the star's luminosity is going up and its radius is going up, its temperature also kind of drops and it becomes red. So it gets cool and here's red uh, observationally. So this is just a statement of what the outer layers of the star are doing. And it reaches a point here, up here, that's called the tip of the red giant branch. And here is where the star, like the sun, will start a, uh, a star, like the sun, will start the next stage of its nuclear fusion life. It will start fusing helium into carbon. It can't go into beryllium because that's an unstable reaction. You don't get energy out of it. Uh, helium goes uh, straight to carbon, uh, which sets off uh, fusion in the degenerate core of the star. This turns out to be a runaway process. The star has no dependency on temperature in the core, so if the energy temperature increases, the pressure doesn't change, and so the shape of the star, the dynamics, doesn't, don't change. So instead, it gets a little bit of a runaway process. It sets off this helium fusion bomb inside the center of the star, which uh, we call the helium flash. It puffs up the core, uh, lifts the fusion, and the star then settles into a new state where it's fusing helium into carbon in a non-degenerate gas. A red giant kind of looks like this in its interior. It has a degenerate helium core with a shell fusion source and then an envelope around it. And this is what it's doing as it climbs up this part of the uh, red giant branch in the HR diagram. So that helium flash uh, causes the star to move from the tip of the red giant branch and settle down. There's some bouncing here you might see. And then it settles into a single point uh, called the helium burning sequence, which also, because of where it appears in the observer's HR diagram, shows up as a uh, on a horizontal branch. So same letter could be two different things. Here, it's undergoing stable nuclear fusion of helium into carbon in the core of the star. And uh, this often also shows up on the red side in a red clump. So red clump stars are also helium burning sequences or also on the horizontal branch. And a helium burning star looks like this. It has a core helium burning, a shell of inert helium around it. Uh, we have a shell of hydrogen creating more helium, and then an inert envelope over uh, outside. But that stable configuration only lasts as long as the star can fuse helium uh, into carbon. And after that, it starts building up a degenerate carbon, oxygen, and neon car, uh, core, which is uh, oxygen and neon come from just extra helium fusion onto the carbon. And we start climbing up, doing essentially the same thing that happened on the red giant branch. And this is called the asymptotic giant branch. And it sort of increases in size again until it gets to the top and undergoes what are called thermal pulsations. And in a thermal pulsation, a star is uh, sort of the, the helium fuel uh, source, the sorry, energy source is a little unstable and it starts at these high luminosities pushing on the outer layers of the star, and those outer layers of the star actually get thrown off. And it does this sequentially, where it pulses and throws off some layers, and pulses and throws off more layers, because there's less to hold the star together. And eventually, it throws off all the layers of the star. And so an asymptotic giant branch star looks a little like this, where we have a degenerate carbon-oxygen core, we have shell helium burning going around it, a layer of inert helium, some shell hydrogen burning, and then an inert envelope around that. 
the after the thermal pulsations throw off uh, these layers, the star evolves essentially horizontally uh, on this branch, and it does it quite quickly on what's called the white dwarf cooling sequence. And that sequence is what happens when you sort of have a star, uh, a, a, a degenerate carbon oxygen neon core at the center is becoming newly exposed and it's giving off its outer layers. Uh, that gas has left the star and it starts to cool down and settle into the white dwarf portion of the Hertz von Russell diagram, kind of down here in the lower left hand corner. Uh, the outer layers of the star are thrown off and they lead to these beautiful nebula images that are called planetary nebula. You can see the newly emerged white dwarf right here at the center of the star. And then these outer layers are the envelope of the star. They've been ejected outward and are just this, you know, they lead to these gorgeous images uh, that we see uh, here. And this is just the outer inert layers of the star returned to the galaxy that formed them. They're called planetary nebula just because early astronomers found them, they thought they were planets, and then they realized that they weren't. And so they called them planetary nebula to stop, you know, create catalogs of them and stop getting confused as they are surveying the sky. All right, so that covers the evolution of a single solar mass star, one solar mass star like the sun. Uh, and I hope it relates what's happening on the interior of the star to what we actually observe in the outer parts of the star. Uh, these are called the evolutionary tracks, and you should know, not the details of the stellar physics, but you should know that stars with different initial masses follow different stellar tracks. So uh, our one solar mass star is right here. We see the pre-main sequence. We see the evolutionary track here. Uh, as we increase in mass, they behave differently. A 30 solar mass star, instead of going the, through these vast changes in luminosity, has a pretty constant luminosity, but its temperature changes dramatically uh, over its short, short life. Uh, and so you sort of see that different so, uh, mass stars have different um, uh, tracks, and that's reflecting different physical processes inside them. Not going to go into details, black box, uh, but you should know that they're occupying different parts of the evolutionary sequence. Moreover, stars with different metallicities also have different uh, tracks. And so this uh, red curves here show the tracks that you see for one thousandth of the solar, lumen, uh, solar metallicity value. They have different tracks because there's less opacity. These metals are very important for blocking uh, the light from traveling straight from the core to the outer layers of the star. So they end up as insulation. Um, so they kind of slow down the loss, uh, the rate at which energy uh, moves through the material. And it's like having a big puffy coat here in an Edmonton winter. It keeps you from radiating away your energy. Uh, and those stars tend to be a little, uh, with the stars with some insulation, tend to be lower luminosity and shifted uh, lower luminosity and lower temperature. Uh, uh, low metallicity stars are higher temperature, higher luminosity. Now, something that you don't get to cover as much in Astro 320, but is nonetheless really important for us, is the idea of mass loss. Stars are all losing mass. There's no like lid on a star keeping its material together. Instead, it's just boiling off particles into the uh, into space. This is the solar wind. Our sun is losing mass, uh, but it's not going to lose a lot of mass over its life. And this is the graph that says for one solar mass star, our sun is going to lose about five. 10 thousandths of its mass. So it's going to go down to 0.9995 solar masses or so, or, you know, start a little higher and a little lower, but it's a tiny fraction. That's not true of high mass stars and high mass stars lose uh, the, at the highest end can lose 70 or 80 percent of the mass uh, of their mass and so this gets blown out in this material that we call the stellar winds and so a lot of material and momentum gets pushed out in uh, high mass stars uh, and their stellar winds uh, if star has a lower uh, metallicity the metals and the opacity 
keep that material from pushing out quite as effectively. And so there's less mass loss at lower metallicities. This is important for house stars and their lives. One of the galactically important ways that stars and their lives is supernova explosion. And high mass stars here, nine tenths of a solar mass or higher, will end their lives through what's called a core collapse supernova explosion, where they fuse material all the way up to the iron peak of elements on that binding energy per nucleon curve. And then they undergo a catastrophic collapse uh, this forms a neutron star at their center, which is a star supported by degeneracy pressure, but made entirely out of neutrons. And then uh, the process of neutronization releases a blast wave of neutrinos that uh, sort of blow off the outer layers in an explosion that has a characteristic energy of 10 to the 44th joules. But there's another way you can get an explosion in a galaxy 10 to the 44 joules, that's not a high mass star ending its life. Instead, if you have two medium mass stars that have ended their lives, but they live in a binary system and they form two uh, white dwarfs uh, that are near each other, and then those white dwarfs uh, end up colliding, this can set off a catastrophic uh, explosion where the carbon and oxygen in those white dwarfs ends up fusing up to the iron peak elements uh, and that energy of fusion uh, up there, uh, up to those uh, heavy elements, ends up powering another explosion that also has 10 to the 44 joules. Completely different mechanisms, uh, but both have to do with stellar evolution uh, and both have the same characteristic energy, which is kind of the maximum energy for common stellar explosions in a galaxy. And it's important because if you're dumping 10 to the 44 joules worth of energy into a galaxy, the galaxy is going to respond. Now in our field in galaxy evolution, we actually care a little bit about what kind of stars explode. Uh, and this diagram here, it's from the Annual Review of Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, by Smith et al. in 2014. Uh, it was this gorgeous schematic diagram uh, that was made here, and it shows roughly the masses of the stars initially, remember this is before the mass loss, uh, and the metallicity, high and low here, and it shows all the different physics that can play out that leads to different stellar explosions. And we've mostly been talking about stuff here. Below about 40 solar masses, uh, ordinary stars end up going and forming um, neutron stars here. And then you can also form black holes. If you form a neutron star but then dump extra material on it, that neutron star can collapse into and form a black hole. So this boundary here shows uh, the region up here where stars will form neutron stars. And stars inside here will end up forming uh, black holes. Uh, that will either be through fallback, which is material raining onto a newly formed neutron star, uh, causing a collapse, or collapsing directly to a black hole. And these will not produce a supernova. Uh, so if you basically have a star and it collapses and it doesn't undergo neutronization or anything like that and just falls in and forms a black hole, then you end up just disappearing the star no explosion. So we actually care about whether a star undergoes an explosion or not because again those star explosions are stirring up and giving feedback to the galaxy. So uh, neutron stars we form some uh, black holes here and then uh, direct black hole collapse without a supernova explosion. And down here in this low metallicity high mass uh, corner here, we get some very exotic uh, phenomenon called pair instability uh, supernova, which can basically obliterate, create a larger explosion, uh, but no black hole as a result. Uh, so we get these, but these happen in very metal free or low metallicity systems. So they're rare in ordinary galaxies like our own. And most of the stuff that we care about ends up forming a few black holes and occasional uh, neutron stars. So wonderful example. Now this is kind of a cool little space here, this direct black hole collapse, because it basically means the star just disappears. And this kind of hard to find because you have to know where all the, like you have to keep track of all the stars and then wait for one to go out uh, on a cosmic time scale. 
But uh, there's a group that's been doing just that. Uh, this is an image from a study by Adams et al. I believe this is using the Assassin survey uh, data. And here's uh, a Galaxy NGC 6946. And what happens is this is before and after imaging using Hubble. And you can see that we have a uh, star here. These are all the other stars. And then no star. And very few things uh, in the world, uh, in the universe, just make stars disappear other than this direct formation uh, black hole. So, all right, uh, given the synthesis of stellar evolution that I have completely run through at a high rate of speed, uh, we can actually sort of break things down into what forms of stellar remnants are left behind for different types of objects. So the um, stellar remnants are uh, generally form white dwarfs, neutron stars, and black holes. And the things that form them uh, depend on the initial solar mass. If you're under nine solar masses, you form a uh, carbon, oxygen, neon, white dwarf. Low mass stars will actually form helium only white dwarfs, but none of them have been around long, we haven't been around long enough for them to evolve to do that. They're supported by electron. This is actually the symbol for positron. I don't know why, uh, but it should be E minus, degeneracy pressure. And they have a characteristic size about that of the Earth. There are tons of white dwarfs in our uh, galaxy, and they're all radiating, uh, giving off uh, light based on cooling off. It's like they you know, pulled this coal out of the nuclear fusion engine, and it's just radiating away the last of its energy into space. In contrast, the neutron star is uh, a neutronium object, pure neutrons. It's formed in the supernova explosion. It's supported by neutron, neutron degeneracy pressure and possibly some weirder physics. Come uh, study grad school here and we'll tell you way too much about it. Um, and it has a characteristic size of our fair city, Edmonton, Alberta. Um, so about that size, radius of uh, 12 kilometers or so. So Hende, Anthony Hende sized the road, not the human. Finally, uh, you form black holes. Again, these are stars with masses between 9 and uh, about 300 solar masses. If It depends on the metallicity as to whether you get a neutron star or a black hole, but anything larger than about 25 solar masses ends up producing um, uh, black, ends up producing uh, um, black holes under most circumstances except for very high metallicity systems where you can radiate away or lo lose enough um, material off the outer layers uh, to get into the neutron star uh, collapse regime. Okay, the last thing I want to do is to circle back to this topic of metallicity. Um, and that's because we've treated everything as X, Y, Z. Hydrogen, helium, other. Uh, but there's a periodic table and we actually care a lot about the periodic table um, for this particular class. And what this graph shows is the logarithmic abundance of elements in the solar system uh, plotted for every element. And what you see here is it has this kind of sawtooth pattern uh, to it. And uh, that sawtooth pattern reflects that even numbers of protons uh, and corresponding sets of neutrons are more stable than odd numbers of protons in nuclei. And so if you have nuclear processes, it's going to favor the more stable nuclei. So carbon, oxygen, uh, all those are even numbered uh, numbers of protons and therefore sort of sets, of, usually sets of four uh, nucleons. Uh, it shows up here. Uh, Hydrogen is the most abundant element in our solar system. Uh, helium, and then there's a dip for lithium, uh, beryllium, and boron. Uh, carbon and oxygen pick up, and then uh, down here, iron is the next most common. And this is a signature of stellar synthesis here, these relative uh, differences of uh, elemental abundances. It is logarithmic, uh, so each of these is a factor of 10. And critically, this is measured currently by number. X, Y, Z are the mass fraction by number here in this graph. And we are going to use a lot of these relative abundances as tracers of different stellar populations. And because this is produced 
by elements coming from stellar fusion uh, and stellar processes. And we see carbon, oxygen, uh, and nitrogen because those show up in uh, fusion processes, uh, helium burning sequences. We also see them in some hydrogen fusion classes for high mass stars. The iron and iron peak elements, the iron, nickel, and the chromium, and the manganese, those show up because of the supernova explosions that we see um, and that peak in the binding energy curve. And then these numbers are really rare because it's very hard to uh, form those. So we'll circle back and talk about the origins of these in the context of stellar populations a little later. Now, I want to introduce you, as we wrap this up, to a couple bits of notation. So we actually use three different metallicity conventions here, and I just want to sensitize you. We have been dealing with metallicity uh, in terms of mass fraction, uh, and we typically have metals are 2% of the mass of the universe or less. We also use this bracket notation. So uh, if we see uh, these... Um, uh, bracket. This is a measurement of elements measured by number, not by mass, and it's relative to solar. So if we look at whatever the alpha group elements are, it's like carbon and oxygen and neon, and we compare that to the abundance of iron, this bracket means that we're going to consider the logarithmic abundance of alpha to iron, and then we're going to correct that to the alpha to iron ratio for the sun. And so this bracket is relative. And so positive numbers mean more of metallicity enrichment relative to the sun. And then negative numbers means lower enrichment of certain indices. The other thing that we'll be aware of is in when we study interstellar medium and gas physics, we often use a just a straight up number, which is the abundance relative to hydrogen measured uh, logarithmically. And we'll often stick a 12 on it for reasons of just wanting to make sure that all our numbers are around, uh, you, know, you know, they're comfortable numbers and they're not too negative too often. All right. So that brings me to the conclusion, everything that we wanted to say about stellar astrophysics, but were afraid to ask. Uh, talk to you all later, and I hope you enjoy uh, the reading. Bye-bye.